Fire Emblem Three Houses can be many things to many people, and in this video, Three Houses is dark, creepy, and disturbing. Despite it being October and the month of Halloween, I actually didn't intend for this video to fall into this time frame as my video schedule got delayed due to Fire Emblem Engage news and Hurricane Fiona setting me back a few days. And now, trying to find a place to rent in the city. This was supposed to be out in September, but alas, here we are. This video is all about this game's darker aspects, of which there are a handful. Just like my Sacred Stones video on its darkest and most messed up moments, this is a content warning. This video does go over topics and themes that can be disturbing to some, so viewer discretion is advised. Things like Crest Experimentation and the Tragedy of Dusker would fit into this video, but I've covered both of those topics several times throughout my channel, like in my videos on Edelgard and the video on the Tragedy of Dusker itself. So for this video in particular, I want to focus on lesser known moments that may have fallen through the cracks to some people. From the mysterious deaths of royalty, to attempts at reanimation, to those those who wish to exploit the Crest system. Without further delay, let us begin. Raphael's Parents' True Fate Officially, as far as Raphael himself cares, his parents died in an accident with monsters while they were working as merchants. Anyone who has seen his paralogue with Ignatz in Three Houses, however, knows the truth is far more complicated. We were. We traveled around the Alliance selling our wares. I heard this route was dangerous, but... Dangerous, you say? Are you referring to the recent cases of merchants being attacked on that route? That's right. We can't turn a profit without going to Deirdre. I don't know what Count Gloucester is thinking. I had a feeling it might be. You're certain? Looks that way. I think he's unhappy with merchants contributing to House Regan's wealth. It seems like he's been at odds with them forever. They say even the previous Duke Regan's death was that the Count's fault too? It's only a rumor, but it was Count Gloucester himself who lured the late Duke Regan out. The side mission and its aftermath reveal the accident was in no way an unfortunate coincidence, but rather an orchestrated attack believed by many to have been ordered by Count Irvin Gloucester, head of House Gloucester, for the sake of getting rid of Duke Godfrey, House Regan's next heir, and to become the most influential house in the Leicester Alliance. Only, the truth of this accident is in reality far more complicated. Three Hopes' paralogue for Ignatz, Raphael, and Lawrence serve as a follow-up to the one in Three Houses. In the paralogue, the three work together to take down mercenaries turned thieves, who at one point used to work for Count Gloucester himself. They discover that this group was responsible for killing Godfrey and Raphael's parents, but they never intended to kill them. Instead, they had only planned to drive them away through use of monsters. With regard to Count Gloucester's involvement though, the orders came from someone else in the house who claimed to be him. The mercenaries lost control of the monsters, and Godfrey was killed trying to fend them off. Once Count Gloucester discovered how this happened, he could not find his imposter. Instead, he punished the mercenary group, ruining their reputation and pushing them into banditry. I was wondering the same thing. Your father was always protective of the nobility's reputation, and it seems strange he would do something so sneaky, and so anti-merchant besides. Based on what the bandits said, I suspect it was someone from our house acting alone. By the time my father realized what was happening, the culprit had vanished, along with any hope of ever sussing out their true motives. Only the mercenaries remained, and my father had no choice but to punish them. Without the context of Three Hopes' follow-up in this paralogue, it was assumed by many that Count Gloucester was a villain in this plot, when it turns out, it was somebody else. Cyril, the House Goneril Servant Per Cyril's backstory, at age 12, he was captured by House Goneril during an Elmiran raid he was forced into, and the house made him a servant for one year before Rhea saw him during a visit, and had him come to the monastery to work for her. What's off-putting about this is that the game never treats it as a big deal, and although Cyril admits he had it bad in his time as a servant, it's surprising to find his support with Hilda that he doesn't really hold a grudge against her or anyone from there. Their folks might not be so lucky. Before Lady Rhea took me in, I had a real hard time as a servant of House Goneril. I'm sorry to hear that, but it's not like I'll go around snapping up all Myron children. That's good, but I just... I want to see things for myself, so I know that everything's okay. Hmm. 
are there supposed to be other Almiran slaves? It wouldn't make sense to me if Cyril was the only one captured and taken to be a servant from the Battle of the Locket, especially so when Cyril considers himself lucky that he was the one who Rhea took in and gave him a much better life in the monastery than both Goneril and Elmira had for him. The fact that he had it bad at House Goneril and nothing else more elaborated on makes me wonder what that life looked like. This aspect of Cyril and Goneril is underexplored, but the fact remains that Cyril was a slave. Kristoff, The Western Church and the Aftermath Both in Three Houses and Three Hopes as her gleam root, Lenato is an early game antagonist who starts a rebellion against Rhea and the Central Church because they executed his son Kristoff years before the game started due to an accusation of him being involved in the tragedy of Dusker, something Lenato believes to be a lie. For this reason, Lenato despises Catherine, whose real name is Cassandra, from House Karen, as she was the one who turned him into the church to begin with. Thunderstrike Cassandra. It was your wretched cemetery that killed my son. <laughs> the only name I answer to is Catherine. Prepare to taste the blade of one who serves the goddess. Now you face a knight of Theros! Long after Lenato is killed in three houses, it's revealed in Ash and Catherine's supports that Lenato's suspicions were spot on. Kristoff was indeed knowingly killed for a crime he didn't commit. The real reason for his execution was because the Western Church persuaded him into helping with an assassination attempt against Rhea, which came before the Dusker tragedy. He's in here. That means this plot predates the tragedy. So there was another plot against Lady Rhea in the past. And my brother was somehow involved. Kristoff and I were friends. We were in the Blue Lion House together at the Academy. If you were friends, why did you hand him over to be executed? There must have been another way. No. If there was another option, I'd have chosen it. But he was foolish. He went along with the plan to assassinate Lady Rhea. I wasn't motivated by a personal grudge. I had no choice but to turn him in. That much is true. I can't believe that my brother would try to assassinate Lady Rhea. But if he did, that means the Church was lying about his involvement in the tragedy of Dusker, doesn't it? Lying is a strong word. The world was in chaos, and the Church did what it had to. If people had known about the threat to Lady Rhea's life, the panic would only have worsened. So you're saying everything in this letter is true. Catherine's name change is also deserving of a breakdown. Have you ever wondered why she's going by that name instead of her true name? The reason for this is that, after Kristoff's execution, Lenato, as revenge, accused Catherine of having been involved in a plot against King Lambert, an accusation which escalated so much in the kingdom that Catherine eventually became a wanted criminal and had no choice but to leave Fargus. And the only reason she's never punished for those charges is because Rhea made her a Knight of Syros and Catherine assumed her current identity. In Fargus. They used to call me Thunderstrike Cassandra. I was implicated in a plot to kill the king. It was a totally false accusation, of course. I had to flee the kingdom, and the archbishop took me in. So I probably should have asked before, but what kind of connection did you have with Lenato? I'm responsible for the death of his son, Kristoff. Ash's adoptive older brother. In response, Lenato pinned a baseless crime on me, making it impossible for me to ever return home. In a way, I suppose I should thank him. If not for that, I never would have taken up with Lady Rhea. This whole situation is filled with lies that the other side deemed necessary for their goals. It's a complicated web, but to simplify it all, Kristoff was involved with the Western Church in a plot to kill Rhea. Cassandra of House Karen brought him to justice, but instead of publicly acknowledging the assassination plot, Rhea deceived the public and implicated Kristoff in the tragedy of Dusker, to keep the stability of herself and the Church's image intact to avoid chaos. Lenato, however, accused her of being implicated in what seems to be a separate attempt from the tragedy to kill the king. Lenato's word was so credible though that eventually Cassandra was branded as an enemy to the kingdom. This is what led to her becoming Catherine. Were these lies justified? If there's a lie coming from the church, it's being made by Rhea. Weaving deception and revision for the sake of avoiding conflict is exactly her MO. Speaking of… 
Rhea rewrites history. At the end of Verdant Wind, per Claude's request and given Rhea has nothing left to lose, she reveals who those who slither in the dark are, who are the children of the goddess, and she finally admits that the history her church claims as the official truth is nothing more than a lie. To protect the holy tomb as they quietly lived out their lives. But then, Nemesis appeared, bringing tragedy along with him. Even now, I cannot forget the sight of that massive canyon painted red with blood. I was never able to forgive those who proudly wielded weapons crafted from the corpses of my brethren. I was the only survivor of Xanado, and all I could do was wander across Fodlan, clinging to my desperate desire for revenge. Per her own words, Rhea promoted her own version of history, created the Church of Syros, and co-founded the Adrestian Empire for the sake of gathering an army big enough to gain the chance to kill Nemesis. But what's often missed of this reveal is how much this move affected everyone involved. For the sake of preventing another genocide against her surviving kin, Syros removed the children of the goddess as a species in Fodlin from official records. All the dragon forms she and her saints used to support the Empire became mythical beings a associated with the church. After doing so, Seros made a new narrative to persuade humans to her side, claiming to be a prophet from the goddess, that the blood and weapons Nemesis and his crew had were divine gifts granted by said goddess to fight evil, and that now they were all being corrupted and needed to be put down for the greater good. Nemesis, the king of liberation. He is an ancient king of mankind who was defeated by Seros over a thousand years ago. When Fodlan was attacked by wicked gods, it is said that the goddess gifted Nemesis with the sword of the creator. Nemesis used that sword to defeat the wicked gods, saving all of Fodlan. Henceforth, he was dubbed the king of liberation. However, his power began to corrupt him until he himself turned to the darkness. Saint Seros was forced to destroy him. Rhea, in fact, glorified those who killed her brethren and formally founded Fodlan's Crest system, which she felt she had to make because Nemesis and co. had a very positive reputation with humanity. In an interview with series director Toshiyuki Kasakihara, he answers the following question. Why did Seros, Lady Rhea, appropriate Nemesis and the Ten Elites as heroes in her history? Because from humanity's perspective, Nemesis and the Ten Elites were thought of as heroes. She can't create a history that completely ignores the feelings of humans upon ruling over humanity. So while preserving them as heroes, she was able to rewrite other parts of history to her advantage. The sad part of this tale is that the truth of everything found a way to surface in the end. Upon hearing Seros' propaganda, Nemesis quickly realized what she was trying trying to do, and, as stated in the King of Liberation class description, he made a counter speech to rally his people where he called her a liar and would free Fodolin from her clutches. Seros and Nemesis's contrasting narratives led to Wilhelm, the one who helped Seros persuade humans into joining her, believe the whole ordeal between Seros and Nemesis was one of opposite interests, and left a record of his truth for his descendants, which a millennia later came back at Rhea in the worst way as the current Adrestian Emperor Edelgard was fed up with the system and the church's lies, and decided to take matters into her own hands. This is an aspect of Rhea that I've always found both fascinating and tragic. Rhea acted selflessly in this moment. In order to preserve peace, she had to glorify the life of the man who brutally murdered her kin, ripped their bones and hearts, and forged them into these terrible living weapons and destroyed her home. She had to glorify the lives of the humans who wielded such weapons against her and the remaining Nabataeans who fought alongside her in the War of Heroes. This is all even more saddening when you realize that when Edelgard and the Empire raided the Holy Tomb, they desecrated the resting place that Rhea herself built for them to once again use their hearts as a source for inhuman power, 1,000 years later. The Crest of the Beast and the Curse of the Relics Fodlin's hero's relics are in an interesting position in its setting. Despite 99% of people believing them to be divine weapons, true origins aside, they behave a lot more like cursed weapons in practice. For one, even if their users happen to have a matching crest, the weapons are stated to inherently consume their lifespan. Show pieces. I only use Thunderbrand when I need its power. I won't waggle it around for your entertainment. You know, even though it's compatible with my crest, it still takes its toll on me. 
Every time I use it, it wears away at my soul. Not that you'd understand. Then there's that one property of being capable of transforming non-crested users into demonic beasts, which the church has been actively keeping under wraps to publicly avoid mass hysteria. And it's not like this fear is unwarranted, because the crest of Maurice and its lineage became tainted for this reason. And even then, this crest is also a special case given the Blood Gang, the relic synergistic with the crest, was able to turn Maurice himself into a demonic beast anyway. It said there were once 12 heroes who saved Fodlan. There was the King of Liberation, Nemesis, the Ten Elites, and finally, Maurice. One day, Maurice suddenly transformed into a hideous beast and slaughtered innocent people. It was like when Miklon of House Gautier turned into a black beast. The negative energy dwelling within his crest turned Maurice into a monster. The people of Fodlan grew to despise him and he was stripped of his honor. His whole clan was conquered, and it was believed that his bloodline had vanished. But even now, there exists a few descendants who have inherited Maurice's crest and his curse. My family line is one of them. Three Hopes even elaborates on how much of a unique mystery the crest of Maurice is by revealing in a document that, it's not only possible the sword itself could have somehow granted Morris his crest rather than Nemesis, but that the crest's reputation as a cursed lineage came to be due to known bearers of it suddenly falling ill and or dying in conspicuous accidents, not unlike Marianne's own parents who simply vanished one day and never returned. This is the source of Marianne's overwhelming worry that she brings bad luck to all around her. The Umbral Beast this monster is the final boss of Cindered Shadows, and is created after Elfric uses the Ashen Wolves' special blood and his own with the Chalice of Beginnings, a special Nabataean relic meant to revive people, for the sake of bringing Byleth's mother, Citri, back to life via the Rite of Rising, only for Elfric to end up fused with her and transforming into the beast. The Umbral Beast is an accidental fusion of two people, one of which is dead. Its design is distinctively disgusting, featuring an exposed skull and flesh that tells you the monster was born unfinished. Now let's get into the actual lore. What do I mean by this? Well, Rhea warns Elfric one last time in Cindered Shadows that the Rite of Rising is incapable of fully reviving someone, citing the soul won't return to the body. We're clued she knows this because in Imperial Year 185, she, as Seros, performed the Rite of Rising in an attempt to revive Sothis, which we're told didn't work, but not why. That is, up until Elfric gives it a shot. Citri. Citri. The chalice. It absorbed both of them. An aberration. What is it? An... Umbral beast? So I see. It is just as the last time the ritual was performed. The line uttered by Rhea is curious, as it suggests that Rhea had the same thing happen when she tried to resurrect Sothis, which is somewhat true, except, like I just mentioned, no one was brought back to life. But this did end up having another consequence, Rhea's dubious and self-proclaimed forbidden experimentation to bring back Sothis in the form of her vessels, like Citri and all who preceded her. Indeed, despite Rhea acknowledging that her experimentation is morally and naturally wrong, she does it anyway. Remember, Citri was the twelfth vessel of Sothis who failed to bring her back to life. Citri herself suffered from poor health and a shortened life from being unable to carry out this resurrection. Seen another way, Rhea's experimentation put the lives of her vessels in danger, and even though Rhea grew to adore Citri and treated her like her adopted daughter, perhaps the same could not be said about her other vessels. For example, when Byleth betrays Rhea and sides with Edelgard in the Holy Tomb, she outright calls them just another failed experiment. And while I would give charity to Rhea in that she's filled with rage and wrath towards Byleth in this moment, it may make one wonder just how she viewed the vessels besides Citri. Tree. The Horror of the Crest System It's an unfortunate and recurring theme in the Empire that women are often abused under the Crest System, and stories touching this subject are in no way a rarity, and can be found with Dorothea, Hanuman's sister, and the Maltreat's bloodline. 
In Hanuman and Dorothea's B support, when the former asks Dorothea why she has beef against the status-obsessed nobility, Dorothea comments that she was a product of an affair a noble had with one of his maids. And after she was born, Dorothea and her mother were dumped to the streets, which eventually led to Dorothea's mom dying. As for why the noble did so, she recalls the following. Eventually, after I became a singer, I met the nobleman that I think is my father. Oh. He'd had a child with a maid, but the child didn't have a crest. So he threw them both away. Those were his very words. I can't prove that he really was my father, but I suppose it doesn't matter. He didn't know who I was. And when he flirted with me, my feelings were something beyond fury. I was dumbfounded. Then there's the situation with Hanuman's younger sister. Even though she herself didn't inherit any crest, the fact that House Asar had major and minor crests in their ranks was enough for a noble to arrange a marriage with her just so he could hopefully produce a child with a crest. No matter how much they tried though, this didn't happen. So in due time, Hanuman's sister was mistreated enough for her heart disease to claim her life. This infuriated Hanuman and made him feel useless. And his awareness of such tales being commonplace in the Empire disgusted him so much much that he left Adrestia and started working in Garrick Mach, seeking to use his research on crests to make them available to everyone and thus render them useless, as a way to finally have peace with himself and to bring his sister peace too. Finally, there's Mercedes, Yuritsa, and House Bartels. Mercedes was adopted into House Bartels right after Baron Martritz died, and her mother bore Emil with the head of that house because of his obsession with collecting as many crested heirs as possible. Because of how all three were mistreated by everyone at Bartels, Mercedes and her mother fled to the kingdom, and Emil remained by his own accord to keep his family safe. In spite of being looked down upon and subjected to violence at the hands of the non-crest-bearing children of the house. They were both safe, but all of the hatred and isolation pushing him deeper and deeper into the darkness came to its tipping point when his father announced his plan. Today, I will leave the monastery for good. If I stay, it is only a matter of time before I hurt you. Just like I did those in House Bartels. You can't leave. But... If it must be so, then answer me this before you depart. Why did you kill your father? <sighs> On the day I took his life, father had just discovered that you and mother were hiding at a church in the kingdom. He was considering bringing both of you back home. But by then, mother was past the age to bear children. And so, he proclaimed that he would take the only other female of the Lamine bloodline, that he would take you as his wife. What happened after that? I remember nothing of it. How I killed him, or what his final words were. You... you did it for me. To protect me. Regardless of reasons, a demon is a demon. I have said enough. Upon hearing the abhorrent plan from his father, Yuritsa went berserk and killed him. His half-siblings soon suffered the same fate, by the newly born Death Knight's wrath. And so, in 1176, House Bartels all but completely collapsed. With nowhere left to go, he would eventually be found by Edelgard, and would serve under her as both Yuritsa and as the Death Knight. In my opinion, the situation with House Bartels is the most tragic and disturbing and shows just how incredibly cruel and evil those can act under the crest system in their horrific attempts to acquire more power. Mercedes's stepfather looked at their mother as a failure who couldn't yield him any more power through giving birth to more children bearing the crest of Lamine, and looked towards his stepdaughter his wife's own flesh and blood to fill that role. This is how the Death Knight, this insatiable monster that he needs to control from within or just let loose and rampage without mercy or a second thought, came to be. 
There are few origin stories in Fire Emblem that are as uniquely horrific as this one. It's a reminder that Fodland's crest system on its own isn't evil, but just like every other power structure created by those with good intentions, it can be gamed in the most abjectly disgusting ways. Yuritsa is one of many victims of those who sought out more and more power for themselves, but he is one of the few recognizable faces in Fodlin that has truly become an irreparably broken man. This video serves as one of many on the channel as its own means to document the dark underbelly of Fodlin's world. Many characters must weather, however way they can, the inhumane circumstances they are thrown into against their will. And all of their stories, in one way or another, illustrate the cruelty and corruption lurking beneath Fodlin's relative harmony.